We're in the final stretch, so let's push through the gates and end this. Subscribe to help build my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Alright, the first of the final two episodes begins with Velma and most of the cast arriving at the hospital to check on Dia. She has been diagnosed with bad writing, so she won't remember anything unless she's kept happy for the next 72 hours. I did say bad writing, hence the arbitrary goal to be achieved over the course of yet another filler episode. So back at Velma's, the whole house must be reverted to what Dia remembers it as. The house is turned upside down, Sophie is kicked out like a cheap whore, and Dia is brought home. Dia and Velma sit down, and she finally opens her present from all those years ago, and it's the classic shoes. And no, she won't ever wear them. Dia can't remember jack and shit, so we jump over to the school the next morning, and Daphne experiencing the worst pain a high schooler could possibly go through. Remember, no Russian. That's right, she's ousted from the popular group. Meanwhile, in the gym, Velma interrupts Norville, who is in the middle of a fencing tournament, demanding that he change her grades on a report card to impress Dia. This interruption causes Norville to lose, and he isn't happy. That night, Norville gives Velma the modified report card when they spot Sophie come back to the house to get a blanket for Amanda. Then, the obviously grayed-out Dia turns on the light and asks if Amon had an affair with a kid while she was missing. The hell do you mean, affair? You were gone for two years, presumed to either be dead or fucked off to a different life. Either way, assuming your home life remained the same, despite your open contempt for each other, didn't lead you, the mystery author, to conclude that things couldn't have changed in your absence? Oh, but that's right, it is explained in the show why she makes this assumption. If you are someone that blindly adheres to that argument, I have NFTs to sell you. Anyway, Velma pipes up in fear of Dia losing her memories, and she lies about Amanda being hers and Norville's. This sends Dia into memory overload, and when she wakes up, she remembers there was a secret way into the underground lab through the well at the Jones Mansion. After this explanation, Dia still wonders why Sophie is around, and yet more lies come out that she is Velma's boss and helps with the baby before Norville commits to stereotyping. Norville? Dream. Nah, just kidding, he came back right away. The next morning, Daphne shows up, and was also wrapped up into this web of lies without her knowledge, being Amanda's godmother. Velma then explains the situation quickly, which gives Daphne an idea to restore both her and Freddy's popularity. Over at the Jones Mansion, Daphne and Freddy's mom, Victoria, find Freddy practicing getting swirlied for the coming abuse he'll face at school. So, Daphne explains how the two of them are going to regain their popularity by pretending to be back together. Also, this entire scene heavily emphasizes Victoria for some reason, and that couldn't possibly have anything to do with the story to come, right? So, at school, Daphne and Freddy commit to their plan, while Velma and Norville take care of Amanda. The next day, Norville has almost had enough of Velma. About fucking time, my guy. He explains his journalistic integrity and how he won't do what Velma demands. And then he gives in because she said please. You know, the world of cartoons is incredible, given how physics can be defied at any and all times, because that explains why this amoeba here can stand up on land without a fucking spine. So he at least asks Velma to change Amanda's diaper and gives her a face after yet another snarky comment. Then, over in Lamont's office, Velma, who is looking to dump off Amanda, stumbles upon a welder's mask that the killer also wore. Just then, Lamont comes in, and the scene hard cuts to the Rogers house later, and it has enough misdirection to confuse Google Earth. A SWAT team breaks in, a tank crashes in, and Lamont explains he isn't the killer since he was trying to make a sword for his son, and before any resolution can be met, yet another hard cut interrupts putting us in the Jones Mansion. So Daphne and Freddy's popularity is on the rise as the kids discuss the impact on social media. Then, after Daphne gives Freddy the death stare when he makes a valid concern, he flees, and his mother steps in to talk with Daphne. Victoria takes an interest in Daphne because she's a go-getter, and the only reason a character like this gets this much screen time and involvement in the plot is if she is the killer. 
I know many of you already knew this because you watched it all before I did, but I only pieced it together here before episode 10 confirmed it because this is the only real time the show leans into it. There was Gigi's line back at Fogfest, but that was more on the nose than Scarface's cocaine, so I thought it was a red herring until she said this. People expect you to go together, and it's not forever, just until you're popular enough to do whatever you want, like a homophobic chicken sandwich chain. Yes, the comment about the deliciousness that is God's juicy chicken is unwarranted, but it is the rest of the line beforehand about gaining popularity to then do whatever you want, and it's too late in the show to give a minor character like this this much screen time and dialogue. Then, back at Norville's, he ends his friendship with Velma after years of abuse. He finally stands up for himself, and I would blow off fireworks in celebration, except this won't last long. And now for perhaps, unironically, the laziest scene in a show or film I have ever seen in my entire life. Check this shit out. Velma sulks for a moment and notices Amanda isn't in her stroller. Amanda rolled out with Velma in tow, through traffic, into town, through a demolition site, and all the way to Spooner's. This is where the party for the brains is being held, and where Daphne and Freddy continue their plan to regain popularity. They are then told to make out to prove they're an item, and who should walk in at that exact moment? Velma. But wait, this cosmic alignment isn't over yet. Velma mentions Amanda rolled all the way over here to find her mom. And guess who should walk through the door at that exact moment? Fucking Dia and Amon, and oh, the cherry on top. Sophie just starts breastfeeding Amanda. And that's not to mention the time is up. If the stars align any more, the old ones will awaken. So the jig is up, and Velma and Amon have to come clean about everything they've lied about. And Dia remembers who the killer is. It's her. Yeah, okay. So Dia is arrested, and Velma, in disbelief, sets out to prove her mother's innocence. Pressing on, Norville and Daphne aren't going to help because of the animosity between them, so Velma ends up at the police station after she tries to throw hands with Daphne, and Daphne's moms show Dia confessing to the crime. Velma isn't allowed to talk to Dia because the sheriff is so strict, the only way he'll give Velma any attention is if she does something terrible, like murder. So we jump over to the Jones Gentleman's Accessories building, where the obvious killer discusses her plans to have Daphne help grow Freddy into the businessman she wants him to be. Over at the Jones Mansion, Velma finds Freddy losing his shit like he was just bumped down from bronze to iron. Freddy isn't happy he's still being treated like a child, and was trying to prove that he isn't by painting the company logo. Which he fails to do, and this is the first step to completing the mystery machine. Yeah, too little, too fucking late. Anyway, Velma uses him to access her mom, because police will only ever listen to white people complaining about minorities? Yeah, okay. Back at school, Daphne is trying to find Velma. Norville wants nothing to do with Velma, and the show again reinforces that Gigi is no longer a character. Isn't that ironic? A show written by a diverse group of writers who have ultimately taken away the agency and individuality of a prominent black character? Where have I seen that kind of thing before? Anyway, Daphne finds a note inside a geode in her locker at school from her birth mom, who isn't dead, apparently, because the plot needs to be wrapped up. How did the mom get into the school, know which locker is Daphne's, know the combination, and know that Daphne would be the best person to leave the chain with to solve the mystery of the killer? And why didn't she just go back to Daphne's house and give her the chain with a touching apologetic goodbye? Well, I would love to know the answers about that too, but it appears even the planets are in position as well, so I'm going to purchase some cultist robes and a Chris knife off Amazon so I'm not fed to a Shogoth once the old ones are released. Now, over at the jail, Velma is allowed to talk to her mom, who tries to tell Velma what is happening, but conspicuously keeps repeating the same line. Velma then pieces together what any audience member did in previous episodes, and despite snapping her fingers in front of Dia, Dia's hypnosis is not broken, and the sheriff takes her away! So Velma is locked in the cell, and Daphne shows up with a pocket watch attached to the chain? God. Damn it! where the hell did the pocket watch come from, and why did the chain get shorter? 
It was twice the length and a necklace a moment ago. Is this even reality? Has the great priest Cthulhu already awakened? Damn it, now I'm gonna have to overnight the package. Well, while I question reality, Velma's reality is called into question when her fucking visions pop back up. That's right, like her mother, Velma was hypnotized this entire time, so whenever someone snapped their fingers in her proximity, like Daphne earlier in this season, Velma should have instantly remembered, but of course, that shit didn't happen. Not only this, but the magical necklace chain turned pocket watch is also, in fact, general meetings. So Velma remembers that she was hypnotized, and Daphne apologizes about the last week before getting a call and heading outside, where she is taken away by a limo that Freddy's dad called instead of him. Meanwhile, Velma runs off to the high school to ask the brains if they remember the pocket watch. And she's naked. Why? Well, that's an interesting question, you ask their disembodied voice that leads me to believe that Rilia has risen. Why did she go in there totally nude, despite the urgency to save her mother? Well, she's nude and pulled the pocket watch out of one of two possible guesses. And yes, they managed to squeeze in a sound effect. Also, yet again, Velma has the memory of a goldfish because she forgot that she can snap her fingers and probably break any hypnosis on the brains. Instead, the brains know nothing, and Gigi finally decides to use her words, this time to complain about Velma being the reason that Norville left. At that moment, Norville is on his way to a new school. Back at her place, Velma can't figure out anything, and on a whim, decides to listen to every single voicemail Norville left going all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, Velma has over two years of voicemails that she never listened to, and she decided to now, despite the importance of her mom being sent to death row, and finally develops feelings for Norville. And what does all of this lead to? That's right, Mindy's favorite writing mantra, convenience. In his first voicemail, Norville mentioned that he thinks it's sweet that Velma wears her mom's glasses in her absence. Then, when Velma takes them off to reminisce, for the first time in two years, she notices they were made by Jones Gentleman's accessories. Then she does a quick Google search that we don't get to see, and grabs Amon to head for the Jones Mansion. The two arrive, and Velma hops the wall and descends the well, but decides to call and apologize to Norville first. Right before hanging up, she mentions she loves him and falls down the shaft because of the bats attacking her. And, once again, death is avoided because Velma fell into the water over there instead of the ground over here. And because of the water, her phone is dead. But she presses on because she still has the notes. And after finding what looks like a health upgrade from Terraria, Velma has found the lab. She opens the door, the killer doesn't notice right away, she somehow gets past like her sneak is 100, and she uses the perfume to attract the bats to distract the killer so that she can be knocked out. Yeah, for some reason, the perfume attracts bats. That That's not explained either. Anyway, Daphne and Freddy are freed, the killer is tied up, and Velma now decides to explain to us the entire mystery she solved literally five minutes ago. First off, of course the killer is Freddy's mom, Victoria. It is explained she is General Meeting's daughter, which we never saw, though Velma did. And the entire reason Victoria did all of this was to get this replace Freddy's brain with a hot girl's brain so that a woman could have all that comes with being a successful white man. You heard me right. The killer is a woke modern-day feminist. So Freddy's hypnotized dad comes in, knocks them all out, and the flips have been tabled. Victoria offers Velma the chance to understand, and she fakes taking the deal, using this moment to infuriate Freddy, who breaks free from his bonds and overpowers his dad. Victoria runs away, Freddy frees Velma, and he gives chase. But they just couldn't even give Freddy the time of day, because his mom managed to convince him she was possessed by the ghost of Dr. Purdue. Freddy's moment to prove he's not a child to be coddled anymore and take action is undercut by his intelligence being lower than your average communist? Really? Anyway, so Victoria is about to save the world from Mindy's writing when Daphne confesses her feelings for Velma, and Velma does the same, but for Norville, who happens to also slide down the rope at that exact moment, despite the rope not having a counterweight. 
Victoria fires and Norville deflects the bullet because apparently he's as fast as Strider hear you and it ricochets off a stalactite which falls, killing Victoria. And there we have it, without worrying about any of the nonsense that occurs setting up the second season, we have finally finished Velma. So what else can be said? Well, thankfully not much. First off, the amount of convenience in these last two episodes outnumbers the Irish army, and I'll expand on this topic in another video a little later. But in the meantime, I was wrong. The writing staff couldn't even be damned to give us a full hour of mystery-focused content with how little happens. Compounding this, Velma is the worst kind of mystery, one that gives the audience all kinds of different information that ultimately leads to nothing. Red herrings have a purpose, but they must be believed. If I have complete confidence that a specific character is not the killer despite what the show is trying to tell me, then I'm just left wondering why. On the other hand, if I know that it's someone else is the killer and the show gives that specific character more screen time than they've had the entire show up to that point, then you've overplayed your hand and the mystery loses most of its impact. This is like the crap that Knives Out pulled when the grandma, not 20 minutes into the movie, gives away who the killer was when she asks the girl if she's her grandson. What I said in that review holds true. The best mysteries give both you and the characters clues and information over time to piece the puzzle together. If information is withheld from the audience, but not the characters, it creates a break in the immersion. It is no different than, say, a parent choosing to keep wisdom from their past years to themselves. This births resentment so that when the inevitable explain the mystery exposition dump happens, it robs the audience of that aha moment. Imagine you're really far into solving a Rubik's Cube, but you can't quite figure out the last step. Then someone walks up, takes the cube, turns around, and hands it back to you completed and tells you the last steps rather than helping to teach you the last steps so that you can do it on your own. You'd rip your fucking hair out, and that's what a lot of these modern day shit tier writers do not understand, whether it be Mindy and her writing staff, Ryan Johnson, or whoever, because they don't actually care about what they're writing. And that leads to the world building having as much effort behind it as season 8 of Game of Thrones. Again, Daphne in front of Velma in episode 3, the brains in episode 9, or Velma in front of Dia and herself in the jail cell in episode 10, all should have immediately broken the hypnosis, but nope, Mindy and the others couldn't care less. I understand if you forget a detail or two about something from a long time ago, but a writer transcripts ideas and organizes what people say and do. Writers should be intimately involved with their creations. But these writers, they couldn't care less. Why? They got paid, so fuck us, I guess. And that's why Velma is one of the worst shows ever made in entertainment history and will forever be a shit stain that undiluted bleach under the power of God's elbow grease couldn't possibly clean out. And yes, I would say confidently that it is worse than the mousetrap across the nuts that is Rings of Power. Almost everything about Velma is an abject failure, and one could make a career by using this show as a perfect example of how not to write a story, develop characters, tell jokes, and most importantly, treat the fans. And that's it. We persevered and conquered Velma. At least until season two comes back with a vengeance. I thank you all for watching and supporting me. Stay tuned for more to come in the form of discussions, shorts, a return to the Witcher blood origin to finish that up, and finally, long-form content, starting with one of my favorite movies of all time. Until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.